Hello. Hey, man. So let's start with abolish police and prisons. Sure. What are you going to do with all the murderers and rapists once we let them go? Why would we let them go? You're abolishing prisons. Abolishing so police and prisons doesn't mean getting rid of public safety institutions. Abolishing police and prisons means that the current uh, institutions that we have are focused on carceral and retributive justice, and we want to move to a system that's more focused on transformative and restorative, restorative justice. So we would still have institutions um, available that can like house people that commit crimes, um, but we would be focusing more on like mental health care <coughs> institutions as opposed to just like carceral punishment. So there can still be institutions okay, so, that house killers and murderers. They just wouldn't be prisons. What 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 would they be? Day camps, uh, summer camps. They, most of them would probably be like mental health care institutions, like places people can go to receive the care that they need. Because clearly, if you're on like a murder spree, there's something wrong with your brain, and we need to address that. Usually, it's a form of psychopathy, and psychopathy, like the lack of empathy, is like a diagnosable clinical thing. And oftentimes, when you have psychopathy and that lack of empathy institutionalized for the safety of yourself or others so all the people who okay let, let's just take all violent offenders because we we can associate most violent offenders with also drug charges and i mean it it, it goes with the whole circus yeah, right what do we drugs. do with all those people well i would decriminalize all drugs so those people dr those drug offenders wouldn't be in prison anyway at least if they're in prison for either pr uh, purchasing holding or using they wouldn't be in there uh, again, uh, oftentimes violent offenses, we can look at like the most violent offenses, which yes, would be drug crimes or then property crime would be like the most. So like armed robbery, things like that are like the biggest percentage of violent offenders. I would focus on the systemic issues that cause those things. So we would have less of those people to worry about putting into these institutions. For instance, if we, if we address systemic poverty, we're going to see a massive decrease in people that commit armed robbery. Because if you have money, you're not going to try to steal money from somebody else because you already have the money. You're not going to risk armed robbery if you have the. You're not going to try to steal someone's iPhone if you have the money to just go buy yourself an iPhone. So where does that money come from? Where does that money come from? The money we already have. Whose money is that? Ours. Who is ours? Because you don't own any of the money that I own. I'm talking about collectively, our collectively owned money. We all have money that we kind of pool together and then we redistribute that money properly instead of the way we redistribute it now, which is giving all the money to like 1% of people while 99% of people suffer. So you're the talking about distributed at, No, the wealth is not distributed properly. The way we distribute wealth is not, for instance, the federal minimum wage has not risen in accordance with the cost of living. So there are places in America where you don't have to pay, I mean, technically no place has to pay above, minim, above the federal minimum wage. Federal is saying like, you can't pay less than this. There are places that only pay the federal minimum wage while their cost of living has skyrocketed over the last 20 years. This is a bad thing. People cannot afford, I, I'm pretty sure the stat is that there is zero places in America where you can afford a single bedroom apartment on working minimum wage for 40 hours a week. That's a bad thing. I, I, I would say that they have the option to do something different. Such as? So let, let, let's just look at it this way. So I can go get a job for minimum wage or I can go learn a, a, a trade, a skill. Uh, I could go to college. I could do any of those options. All of those things cost money. And no, there's there's several programs, grants, FAFSA. Do you think that, that those for, programs and grants are expansive enough to cover everybody right now? Um, I don't have enough information to, to confidently say yes. Um, I know that in my area, the only reason a child or a young adult doesn't go to a trade school or college is because they don't want to. Um, yeah, I would, and I would, I would say, say most of the time kids don't want to go to college just because there's been a, a massive push from adults to say you don't need college, even though college earners earn non-college by like 50%. 
Uh, so I'd say there's been this massive push to tell kids you don't need to go to college when they do. And I would argue without any evidence, so this is just speculative argument, that the it's coming from from corporations trying to convince kids they don't have to go to go to college so that way they have a plethora of workers. Maybe, maybe not. But what what I would maintain is that you would have to to take control of your own life and, and figure out a way to make more than minimum wage, right? Sure. Do you so, I mean, I, I, I don't disagree with you that people should strive to, to obviously better your life in any way capable, any way possible. But do you recognize that we make it really fucking hard to do that in America? Like it's really hard. Um, I think the stat is that, uh, 49% of Americans can't afford a random $500 expense. And that like, I think it's over 50% live paycheck to paycheck, right? You don't have the freedom to do something else if you're living paycheck to paycheck because one missed check See, fucks up your whole life. I really disagree. I believe that, that that's a choice. So just, just to give you an idea, uh, me and my business partner, uh, he only went to the eighth grade, right? I'm college educated. He only went to the eighth grade. That's all he ever seen. Okay. And then the guys that work for us, uh, we own a construction company. There's, there's none of us like that. Ain't none of us broke bitches. We wake up every this, morning. This would be, we take our bias. ass to work. Yeah. This would be called a bias, right? You're saying, because I don't see it, it doesn't happen or, or because I'm able to do it. They should be able to do it. That's specifically called a survivorship bias, right? So what I'm saying is that it's possible. And if you're not doing it, then it's your fault. Wait, no. Not my fault. No. That's it, what I'm Getting saying. rich, by the way, in America is like entirely based on luck. It's entirely luck based. I, literally. You ask a billionaire yourself. Even Mark Cuban. Mark, Cuban's, Mark Cuban was like all billionaires are only billionaires because of luck. Even he admits that, right? And he's one of the biggest billionaires in the country. Right. Okay, but I don't. I don't need to be a billionaire to be I, comfortable. I'm not, I, wait, I'm not. Now, saying, I'm not saying you have to be a billionaire. All I'm saying is that wealth generation is typically a luck-based thing. Like I said, it's actually 61. 61 percent of Americans live paycheck to paycheck, which means if they miss a check, they miss paying their bills, and one missed bill, right? can really fuck up your life if you're living paycheck to paycheck because then you get behind and it's really hard to catch back up have you ever heard of the of the the phrase it's expensive to be poor yeah okay. it is so every everything costs money right so when i started out we sacrificed and we sacrificed and we sacrificed and we saved and we saved and we saved until we no longer had to sacrifice until we had a couple hundred grand in the bank. So that's my so, point okay. is anybody Wait, you're can missing do it and it's possible. You're missing. That's the point. You're missing what I'm saying here. Right. That is what we in the business call survivorship bias. You were able to accomplish it. So you think that everybody else should be able to, but not everybody is in your situation. Not everybody has. Why would? A, why a, wouldn't a they be able to put themselves a metric in ton that of reasons? Situation. What if somebody is working paycheck to paycheck and they have two kids? They can't afford to miss a paycheck, or they can then they can't feed their kids. What if somebody's okay, working when paycheck started, to paycheck and then their kids. car breaks down? Now we're, three we're, kids. now they have to use whatever little money they saved to help. Like there's, there's a litany of situations here. Right. So what you have is excuse after excuse after excuse instead of solution after solution after solution. Wait. I okay. So we're, we're, we're going to disagree. I did provide we're a solution. The solution there. would be to increase the minimum wage to be, to be in accordance with the cost of living. You should be able to, on a minimum wage salary, have enough money to afford a one-bedroom apartment in whatever place you're living period minimum wage should be able to cover the minimum cost of living just period so what should minimum wage be if we're looking at the cost of living currently minimum wage needs to be around 23 dollars 
Now we can we can we can couple that with just lowering the cost of living, and then we're going to see we not don't have to have minimum wage be as high. But right now, to be in accordance with the cost that it that it means to live, the amount of money you need to live, it would we would have to have minimum wage be around twenty three to twenty four dollars. Okay. Let's move on to systemic racism is real. Okay. So I, I would not say, I wouldn't say that in today's world, systemic racism is real. In the past, sure. Sure, okay. I believe that. But, but you can't hang your hat there either. The Jews were slaves. The Irish were slaves. The Scottish were slaves. I mean, throughout the history of, world, of the world, slavery was not so. just... So and African Americans. Sure, two things about Dang. that. In America, slavery was distinctly black. Uh, even I, the, I even agree. the College of Dublin in that. Ireland it literally goes: this idea that Irish people were slaves is a myth. Like the co the University of Dublin is like, stop saying this, guys, because it's not true. In America, slavery distinctly a black thing. Um, I agree. You, I if if you are saying. Uh, systemic racism existed it doesn't anymore i would just ask when did it stop like what year did systemic racism stop oh i wouldn't be able to put a year on it i, I don't know but i know that in today's world we've got poor white folk and poor black folk and poor mexican folk and poor asian folk and poor chinese folk all living in the same neighborhood take dallas texas for instance and then across town We've got blacks, whites, Mexicans, Chinese, Asians, all live in very upscale neighborhoods. Okay, so I won't disagree that there is poverty, or, 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 like poverty extends across a racial barrier. What I would say is when we look at the disparities in that poverty, it's very clear that one group of people is suffering a bit more. For instance, if we look at the, the average household wealth of white Americans, it's about $180,000. That's the average for white Americans. That's their average household wealth. The average household wealth of black Americans is $13,000. That is a giant disparity, huge. And I would argue that if we look at the policies that were put in place from 1776 upwards of 2010, those policies were directly, directly harming one group of people more, that group of people being black Americans. By the way, the number I quoted is directly out of the US Census, the average household median. That's directly out of the US Census. So for people that go, well, that's not true, it's directly out of our census data. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I don't know the numbers. Um, so I, I couldn't confidently argue with you there, but I know in my part of the United States, I know everyone in the chat is going to be like, oh, well, that's whatever they call it, the an antidotal. Is that what they're saying? Anecdotal. Uh, yeah, anecdotal. So anyway, um, but in, in my part of the world, that's just not the case. Can you name me? Here's what we'll do. Can you name me a policy, law, or, or provision at any point in American history, from 1776 till now, that directly targeted white America and made it hard for white America to earn wealth? No, no, I can't. Can, can you, from let's say 1990, let, let's just take the past 30 years, right? From 1990, what policy are you talking crime about bill. that has targeted black people? The crime bill. How how did the crime bill target black the people? Crime bill disproportionately as far as affected I know, black neighborhoods because it disproportionately sent police into those neighborhoods. Well, as far as I know, crime is, is not racial. So if a, if, a, if a white member commits the same crime as a black member, they're they're both going to jail or they're so both if receiving we look, if whatever we look punishment. directly at the u.s sentencing commission which tells us you know how crimes are sentenced in the united states like they literally take every sentencing in the united states and come up they come up with this data 
we can take a black offender and a white offender who do the exact same crime. We can take them at the exact same level of crime. So they're both first time offenders and we can account for this. They have the same socioeconomic background. The black offender will still receive a higher prison sentence and longer prison sentence. Now, if they have committed the same crime, they have the same offense type, and they come from the same socioeconomic background, what would be the only reason there that the black offender receives more jail time? Well, where, where's your source for that? The U.S. I mean, Sentencing from, Commission. From the, the last 30 years, the last 20 years, the last 10 years. I'm talking about right now. The last year. The last 365 days. And, and what source tells you the last 365 days that a black offender gets more time than a white the offender? The U.S. Sentencing Commission. The people that keep track of U.S. sentencing. You can go to their website. They have an entire interactive graph where you can put in all of these things. And what it shows is that black offenders still receive a higher prison sentence. Well, I can even do you one further. We can even go, go down the rabbit hole a little more, right? If you look at the arrest rates for drug crimes. White people make up 70% of all arrests for drug crimes. They only make up 20% of the prison population for drug crimes. Whereas black people make up 20% of the arrests for drug crimes in 60% of the prison population for drug crimes. Why would that disparity be so high? If it's not systemic racism, what would the answer be? Keeping in mind again, that when we go to the sentencing commission, we can account for all of those variables and that disparity still exists. I would have to look at all the specifics for whatever the charges were. I mean, I, I'm sure there's several different variables. But now, just wait, looking again, at it account, from the outside, I just, hold on just, now. Wait, just, I just looking wanna... at it from the outside in and looking at your numbers, yeah, yeah, that, that looks like uh, the judicial system is racist towards black people. 100% agree that that's what the numbers you're saying makes it look like. What would be the other, what would be the other answer? Well, we would have to look at the specifics of every case. We would have to look I, at I told you you prior can. convictions. But, yeah, again, you look can look at, at this. I already said you can account for first-time offense. You can account for type of offense. You can account for type of felony charge. And when you account, for, when you make all of these the same, black people still receive higher prison sentencing. I would have to look it up and see it. For US for now, we'll take your has all of it. For, for now, we'll take your your word for it. Um, Let's move on to conservatives hate freedom. How, how do conservatives hate freedom? Because it would appear that, cons that conservatives' policies, specifically GOP policies, okay? Thank you, it would, it, would, it would appear to be that those policies are ones meant to limit the freedoms of different American people. For instance, we can just look at the mass amount of bans that they do on gender-affirming health care. That would be taking away parental freedom to decide the medical care you want to get for your child. And I don't think we should allow people to take away the type of medical care a parent should be able to seek out for their children. So I guess most of what you're talking about goes towards the trans debates. That's just one of them. We can also look at the fact that uh, or abortion, conservative or... states limit abortion access. That's another freedom that they are now taking away from somebody. The freedom being you getting to decide what happens to your body. That is a freedom that is now gone. For a lot of women, in a lot of AFAB people, in a lot of states, to the point where we have we had we have laws where there are no exceptions. For instance, Texas does not allow an exception for rape or incest. So even if you are raped, you still are forced to carry that child. So the whole basis of your conservative state freedom is based around the trans debate and the abortion debate. It's, it is there anything the outside? Ones. Yeah, we can also talk about the fact that conservatives are trying to introduce policies to ban Palestinian people from even entering our country. 
that's a limit of freedom. We can talk about the fact that conservatives are pushing policies to try to force uh, schools to display the Ten Commandments in their school and force children to, to recite the Ten Commandments in school. That would be a loss of freedom, specifically their freedom of speech. So, we can look at the fact so that conservative, conservatives have banned mass amounts of books. That is literally just a freedom of speech ban. Currently, all you have is the abortion debate and the trans debate. I just gave you more than that. Well, you're, you're saying they're trying. They're trying to introduce. I, I don't know. I know my my state and my elected officials are not trying to introduce any what of that. What state are you from? I happen to know our secretary of state very well. Um, I happen to know our governor very well. And that's not on their agenda. And we're, Wait, what's, we're the what's largest state red from? state in the nation. What state are you from? Texas. Texas is who be, who've been introducing the Ten Commandment bill. That is literally a Texas um, bill. I, I would have to look. I would have to see. I mean, um, there, there's nothing that uh, Greg or any of them have said that I know of about forcing religion in, down anybody's throat. Wait, I didn't say they were they were forcing religion specifically. What they're doing is they're trying to remove, they're trying to backhandedly get rid of other religions because they don't want those other religions to exist. They want to exist in like a Christo-fascist state. But Texas is also the state who, who, who bought uh, Greg Abbott specifically, who passed a blanket abortion ban that has no exceptions for people that have been raped or people that have experienced incest. He just blanket because he doesn't care. Well, also the conservative Christian believes that that's murder. Cool, but why do your why do your beliefs get to dictate what another person does? Well, the, that would be limiting the freedom the of another person. Mm, if you're saying point, my you religious belief, moral standard. Wait, if you're so saying it, my religious it, belief means that I'm going to pass this policy that removes this, even though there are other people who don't believe what I believe, relig like on a religious level, yes, that is let's, quite let's, literally. Let's take Christianity out of it, right? So at some point, we have to insert a, a moral standard. Into abortion? Sure. Not so, an exception. That would just be silly. Why would that be silly? Because what are we protecting at conception? We're just protecting potential. We're not protecting anything. What needs to be protected when we talk about protecting human life is a subjective human experience, which doesn't begin until about 24 weeks, which is why I think pre pre, pre Roe v. Wade was fucking uh, our pre the overturn of Roe v. Wade was a completely fine system. States could not implement policies in the first trimester states could implement some policies in the second and they could fully implement whatever policies in the third perfectly fine system because it's protecting what we want to protect when it comes to protecting human life okay so you're pro-choice just in the first trimester i am pro-choice I believe you can have an abortion at any time i believe you cannot have a lethal abortion after 24 weeks Okay. <laughs> All right. So moving on. Trans trans men, women are men or women. Okay. Biologically, that's incorrect. Well, bio there is no such thing as a biological woman. So, sure. What do you? How how do you figure? Woman is not a biological term. It's a social term to describe a social category of people. There is no biological line for women. There is a biological line for being female. And that would be the existence, uh, the existence of the ability to produce uh, female gametes, or you can argue it on a genotypic basis. So, like, genotypically female chromosomes. But like, there is no biological characteristic of men and women, just males and females. I would heavily disagree. Uh, a woman would would have to be a female. Um, I don't know. We could do 2,000 years of history. We, we could start with that. Um, we could also start with uh, women have vaginas and men have penises. Males have penises and females have vaginas. That's why we see these things in other animals as well that have nothing to do with being men or women. Right? A so female at, dog at is not a woman, but a female dog still has a vagina. 
Well, you wouldn't call a female dog a woman because it's a dog and not a human. Because so at some time during the exactly. late 1900s, the, the, the liberals have made a segue from woman being separate from female. Gender and sex have been separate since like the early 1500s. They've been two separate topics. I strongly disagree. Well, just I mean, look, just because you look at the etymology of the words and see says that's that it is case. doesn't make it true. Okay, so so then can you define for me what a what gender is? What the concept of gender? What is that? What your reproductive organs are. That's what your gender that, is. That would be the if I look up the definition of gender, it's going to say what your reproductive organs are. Oh well, it, it may not. It may not say that as a definition, but that's what it is. I mean, take if if you've taken A and P one and two or micro, I mean, there there's no getting around. Wait, you, you I can I can I can read you directly out of neuroscience college textbooks and bio, biology college textbooks where they clearly define gender and sex as two different things. Now they're interlinked. In humans, gender and sex have an inherent linking, whether that link is that you you uh, are on the same side of your gender or not, there's still a link there. But gender refers to something social and cultural in nature, while sex refers to a biological makeup. That's just how those two words are used. It's the, it, and it's the only way to use those words that make any sense. Because if we're saying gender is, is just your sex, then we're saying that all animals are men and women, which they're not. Gender, has not. gender is not just your sex. Gender is so much more than that. See, I, I think what you do, well, I think what you do there is you, you try to add muddy, muddy waters to what gender is. And you, you try to split hairs there. That way someone can choose what, whatever they want to be. What if you were water, born, can you explain male, to me what I'm what I'm trying to like what water I'm muddying specifically? Because I, I if if I'm doing that, I'd like to stop doing it. So I want to know like specifically what I'm doing. So if you were born a male, then you are a male. Now you may be a man sure. that wears dresses. Wait, but again, but you, male and man are separate things. Male would re would describe your genotypic and phenotypic sex, whereas man would describe your gender identity. And gender identity is something that we have so, so we have observed to exist. In, no, no, that, gender that's identity. What, hold on, I'm explaining this to you. Gender identity exists in the brain. We have been able to see in the way that our brain is structured and mapped that our brains are wired to create a gender identity. I have multiple studies in multiple brain scans that show this, that our brains are just inherently, instinctually wired to come up with a gender identity, separate of our sexual makeup. You could be born like a Barbie doll or a Ken doll, and your brain would still be wired to formulate a gender identity in some way. Man, I just I, I disagree. Uh, okay, with what? I, I society may push that, and society may give these children ideas that they can they can pick to be a man or a woman to form this this thought of oh well, I have a penis, but I can pretend to be a woman. But it, it, it's still not factual. They're still so, not so women. Hold on. So when you're when you're when you're describing this and you're saying that they pretend to be women, you are presupposing what a woman is. When we are still having yes. the conversation of what sex and gender is at all, so we can't go under this presupposition that woman means A, B, or C. When we're still having that conversation, well, right? then we come back so to the I, terminology battle of female is not woman and woman is not female. So then at that they point, shouldn't. you could you could say anything is anything. No, I gave you direct lines to show that gender identity is a brain structure thing, a brain structure thing. Our brains are structured that way, right? Structured to have a gender identity. So this isn't some mythical line that we're crossing over. This is brain chemistry. 
And at, at what point in our history did that brain chemistry start? What? What? Do you, what? what? Do you I not understand the question? I, I, so I don't I guess understand what that question is asking me. At what point did we see an influx of males wanting to be women and females wanting men, to be men. Men and, men and women existing across gender lines has been a, an observable thing throughout all human history. The issue is that most societies were not as rigid as ours. So like in Greek and Roman society, they you could easily float between gender ideals because they weren't as rigid in doing so. Ancient Egypt had people that floated in between these things. Like this has been observable for all human history. We didn't have the words for it. Like we didn't call it being trans until very recently, but the existence of floating between gender ideals, gender lines and gender categories existed throughout all and I history. Would, I would say that, that Russia is probably a lot more rigid than we are. China would be a lot more rigid than we are. And I, I would, I would say that, that trans is not, I mean, it's not your consensus. It's not your majority for sure. I don't understand what, what Russia and China have to do with anything. So you're saying throughout history that, uh, that this has always happened, that it's always come back, but because the United States is, is so rigid that we're the only ones that have issues with it, or we're the only ones that have problems with it what no i'm saying because we're so rigid in in a gender binary right it is harder for people to understand what being trans is whereas societies where they were not so rigid in gender binary they had much more people easily moving between those gender lines because there wasn't this societal stigma against it gotcha okay well fella i appreciate your time i've i've wasted all the time i can spare today uh thanks for letting me up y'all have a good day okay you too